Frank Lucas is truly a unique man, if you go by his own words. So according to him, he was first a confidant and the closest friend of Harlem's godfather, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson. Then he single-handedly ran a heroin smuggling route from Southeast Asia to the US, personally visited the jungle and defeated a whole group of enemies with a gun in his hands, and in the end, he became the richest drug trafficker in the United States. Lucas so convincingly told the press about it after he was first imprisoned with a 70-year sentence, then released for cooperation with the authorities, that Ridley Scott even made a movie about him, where Frank is played by Denzel Washington. But was it really like that? We have collected for you all possible versions of the facts of Lucas's life, both from him and from contemporaries and researchers of organized crime, and are ready to present the American gangster story from different angles, trying to clarify for you as much as possible where there's truth and where there are lies. And if you're interested in hearing about it, then meet Frank Lucas on the other side of the law. Frank Lucas was born on September 9, 1930 in the town of LaGrange, North Carolina. Times were tough then. The year before Lucas was born, the American economy had plunged into the Great Depression, leaving many families struggling to make ends meet, and as simple farmers, the Lucas family had a hard time. The town where Frank was born is properly called a village. Only a few thousand people lived there, among whom the bulk of the population was white. The Ku Klux Klan was strong in North Carolina. But in a small town like LaGrange, where all the inhabitants probably knew each other by sight, it was unlikely to have any influence. However, according to Lucas, it was during those years that an event occurred that prefigured the rest of his life. Before the eyes of little Frank, his favorite cousin was executed by local clansmen. The reason for the murder was that he allowed himself to look at one of the white girls. The enraged killers showed up early in the morning at the shack where Lucas lived with his family, tied up the 12-year-old, and then shot him in the head with a shotgun. That's how Lucas himself told the story. According to him, it was at that moment he realized that a dark-skinned boy would never succeed in such a society if he played by the rules. However, more recently, researcher Ron Chepesiuk did not slack in visiting the archives of North Carolina and familiarizing himself with those cases in which the local clan crimes were discussed. He found not a single document that described such carnage. Moreover, there are no statewide records of lynchings from 1926 through 1941. Frank wrote that his father went to the local sheriff in search of justice, but he did not even listen to him, instead saying that if he dared to bother him again, he would go to jail. Lucas Sr. returned home furious and promised his family that he would make the sheriff pay for his disrespect. Frank didn't say how, but word reached the sheriff about what his father had said. A few days later, he showed up at the Lucas home and demanded that the father of the family repeat to his face what he had told his family. A scuffle broke out between the men, which quickly escalated into a fight. The sheriff ran out of the house to his car to retrieve his shotgun, but before he could do so, Frank's father managed to shoot him. According to Lucas's recollection, the sheriff was hit in the butt cheek with a shotgun blast before jumping into his car and driving quickly away. The fight with a law officer would never go well, much less an attempt on his life. The father of the family had to go on the run and hide in the woods, only sometimes furtively visiting his own home. Lucas Sr. occasionally brought home game that he managed to shoot in the woods, but his food was clearly not enough to feed the whole family. The Lucases began to starve. In an attempt to help the family, Frank Jr. started to steal. His prey was often chickens and eggs from nearby farms, but once, according to Lucas, he even stole an entire pig. From stealing, Frank quickly moved on to robbery. At the age of nine, he waited outside a local brothel for drunken customers, who he then attacked with a baseball bat. Little Frank liked this kind of income much more than stealing chicken eggs. The attack on the very first victim brought him as much as $10. With that amount, his family was able to live for several months. A few years later, Frank really matured and made an even bigger score. He managed to steal $400 from a local store. The 13-year-old realized that for committing such a large theft, he would really be a wanted man, and so he decided to leave his native land. Leaving his family 200 bucks, Lucas went to Kentucky. However, the teenager never reached his destination. The bus heading to Kentucky made an hour-long stop in Knoxville, Tennessee. 13-year-old Frank decided to take a walk, and not far from the bus station, he saw guys playing craps, a type of dice game, among themselves. Frank was already familiar with the game. He had mastered the strategy of craps back home in North Carolina. After watching the boys, Frank decided to join them, putting only $1 on the line, 
Lucas was ready to carry away the whole bank half an hour later. However, the losers did not let him. Lucas was beaten unconscious, and when he came to, he made two discoveries. His bus had long since left, and there wasn't a single dime in his pockets. Hungry and beaten, Lucas struggled to get to a grocery store, where he stole some food and was arrested a few minutes later. The next day, 13-year-old Frank stood trial. According to Lucas's recollection, the judge spoke so fast that he understood nothing, neither the substance of the charge nor what he was sentenced to serve and for how long. Lucas was sent to reformatory labor, where in the heat and in shackles, he dug trenches and built roads as part of a crew of similar black men. However, Lucas did not stay there long. He was helped by a dark-skinned overseer named Jimmy Reed. First, he persuaded the officers to take off Lucas's shackles, and then he gave him a long rope. The thing is that the prisoners were never left unsupervised for a minute, and the only time they were left alone was when they used the toilet. The prisoner would tie one end of the rope to his hand and give the other end to the officer. The rope wasn't particularly long, so escape was a problem. But Frank, as we said earlier, had one of his own. Handing the warden the end of the long rope, Lucas was able to get a good distance away from him. At some point, the warden realized that Frank was too far away and rushed after him on horseback. However, Frank's luck won out and he was able to escape. After breaking away from his pursuers, Frank wandered for a while. In the late fall of 1943, he was finally able to settle in the town of Lexington. According to Lucas's own recollections, thanks to his appearance, he was able to seduce a widow. Apparently, he looked much older than his years, and lived in her house for a while. Then, with her support, he managed to get a job in one of the local factories. There, a woman intervened in his life again. Frank began a rocky romance with the daughter of the business owner, but one of the local workers began to blackmail the lovers, threatening to reveal their relationship to the girl's father. As a result, the future Storm of Harlem had to again flee. Lucas stole a couple of hundred dollars from the factory cash register and decided to forever leave the harsh south of the United States. His way lay in New York. Even in his childhood years, Frank had heard that New York City was a place where thousands of black people lived together in peace and prosperity. So upon reaching the city that never sleeps in the summer of 1944, Lucas immediately approached a policeman and told him he was trying to find where the colored people lived. In response, the policeman put him on a bus to 114th Avenue in Harlem. Frank had no money with him. The 200 bucks he had stolen from the cash register ran out on the way. So he was going to take care of his basic needs first, finding shelter and food. The latter he managed to steal from a local diner, and he spent the night in the basement of an apartment building where local coal was stored. Subsequently, in his memoirs, Frank Lucas repeatedly drew attention to the conditions he had to live in. His descriptions of expensive apartments and richly furnished houses sometimes resembled rent advertisements, but they always had one goal, to show the contrast between the places he had to live initially and the heights that he managed to reach. From then on, Frank Lucas's home was Harlem. Frank was in a rut, however, and he wanted to make some cash. He immediately decided that he would not engage in honest labor. Instead, he took a seat on a street corner and began to watch intently as several passerbys played an illegal lottery, the so-called numbers game. They would hand bills to a man who would then take them to one of the neighboring residences. Frank had never encountered lotteries before, but he didn't need to. He wasn't about to learn the intricacies of this new amusement. He had seen a man with a wad of bills by himself carrying them somewhere. The next day, Frank ran up to the man as he was counting the proceeds, snatched the money from his hands, and ran away. In a matter of minutes, Frank became as much as 100 bucks richer. Within a few months, Frank was on a robbery spree. He robbed lottery players, store owners, and delivery men. After earning enough money, Lucas bought his first gun and rented a room in a boarding home. Around the same time, Frank met a guy named Fletcher who, like Lucas, was from North Carolina. Fletcher was a heroin addict, and it was from him that Frank first learned of the existence of such a drug. Frank recalled that he constantly experienced bouts of nausea when meeting his new acquaintance. Fletcher and his company of like-minded junkies looked like a bunch of sick, desperate, and pathetic people. But Frank paid attention to more than just appearance. No matter how bad they looked, they always had enough money to buy a dose. That made Frank think that he could make a good living selling drugs. But Lucas realized that he couldn't just walk up to a drug dealer and tell him he wanted to buy. He needed someone to vouch for him, so Frank asked Fletcher's company if someone could put him in touch with the dealer. Such a person was found and soon Frank bought his first batch of heroin for 300 bucks, only half an ounce or about 15 grams. 
One of Fletcher's friends also gave him a short course on how to prepare the product for street dealing. Using quinine and baby powder, Frank diluted the purchased merchandise, increasing its weight but decreasing the percentage of heroin content. Once on the street, Frank found that all the heroin sold out within three hours, making him nearly $900 richer. That same day, the novice drug mover bought another ounce from the dealer and got involved in the drug business. Frank realized pretty quickly that drug dealing took much less effort than robbery and brought much more income too. With these first relatively large earnings, Lucas rented his first apartment in New York overlooking Central Park on 7th Avenue and furnished it to his liking. He bought a car, expensive clothes and shoes, which for Frank would be a lifelong weakness. In a very short period of time, Lucas had accumulated almost half a million dollars. After sending some money to his parents, Frank stopped trading and went off to savor the spoils. He began to spend a lot of time at the gambling table, but luck was not always favorable to him. Adding to his gambling vices was his addiction to alcohol. Frank recalled that he often crashed his cars while drunk. At first, it did not cause any problems. He left the wrecked car right at the scene of the accident and went to the dealership for a new one. But at one point, money became so scarce that he had to sell his favorite red and black Cadillac. It even got to the point where Lucas received an eviction notice. Frank, having lost everything, tried to get back into the drug trade. But since Lucas owed money to several dealers, no one wanted to do business with him. Eventually, the homeless and nearly destitute Lucas was offered to buy a small batch of heroin, but a few days later, he was arrested. His first real prison sentence was nine months, which he spent in a jail called The Tombs. Lucas later recalled the months spent in lockdown as a time of rethinking his entire life. He realized that his bad habits would not do him any good and promised himself that once free, he would do everything he could to get back to dealing heroin. After serving his time, Frank immediately began to put his plan into action. Right after his release, he robbed several grocery stores, but these raids did not bring much money. Lucas decided to rob somewhere more stacked, a jewelry store. Frank pretended to be a rich customer, and when the salesperson brought him more goods to choose from, grabbed the jewelry and safely escaped. Lucas was able to flip the stolen goods the very next day. A local fence named Cool Breeze offered him $30,000 for all the jewelry at once. If Frank had waited a few days, the amount could have been more, but he needed the money urgently, so he agreed to give it all at once. Frank got his money, but he was struck by the ease of which Cool Breeze dished it out to him. Frank wondered where the fence had gotten such large sums of cash. He suspected that buying hot jewelry was not Cool Breeze's only occupation. And he was right. It turned out that the jewel thief didn't mind gambling at an underground establishment on 145th Avenue. And he did it quite successfully. The place was called The Big Track. There were games for respectable guys and for those who could afford to lose 20 grand in one game. Frank decided to rob the place. Even though it was July, Lucas wore a coat under which he hid two guns. The doorman recognized Frank as he had been there before when he had money and let him inside. After watching the game for about 10 minutes and making sure there was enough cash on the table, he drew his gun and demanded that those present give him all their money and jewelry. Frank's haul totaled $15,000. He later regretted doing it alone. Had he an assistant, the two men would have been able to carry off much more money. That same night, Frank went to spend the loot in one of his favorite bars. There, he met a friend who was already aware of the day's events. He urged Frank to get out of town quickly because Cool Breeze and the other robbers were going to kill him as soon as they had the chance. Lucas thanked his friend for his concern, but replied that he would not be running from anyone. For the next few weeks, Frank lived in a state of high alert. He carried a gun at all times and tried not to sleep in the same place two nights in a row. Frank continued to spin the loot, yet no one ever got back at him. In his book, Lucas explained it simply. With his antics, he gave the impression of a real psychopath, a crazy type, capable of doing anything, and nobody wanted to mess with a crazy person. The $15,000 ran out very quickly. Frank thought it would be a good idea to learn another way to make some easy money without resorting to robbery and theft. And while reading the newspaper, he noticed a small article about a local assassin named Ice Pick Red. This man was famous for sticking an ice pick into his victim's chest in broad daylight and then silently walking away, leaving them to die in the street. Frank had heard of Ice Pick, but never met him personally. Lucas thought he was an unpleasant, disgusting bastard, but there were rumors on the streets that for $25,000, Ice Pick would kill anyone you pointed a finger at. Frank decided he could be useful to him as an assistant. A couple of weeks later, Lucas caught up with the killer on one of the streets of Harlem and tried to talk to him but he did not give the former drug dealer even the dignity of a glance. 
Soon, fate gave Frank another chance to meet with Icepick. The assassin had a weak spot for billiards, in which he had no equal. He preferred to play for big stakes. Anyone wishing to contest with him had to put at least $1,000 on the line. Lucas, who was in ruin by that time, accidentally bumped into Icepick in the pool room. He had less than 100 bucks in his pocket, and for an offer of such small amount, Icepick of course refused. At the moment Lucas was arguing with Icepig, Harlem's godfather, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, entered the billiard room. Bumpy wondered what was going on and then asked Frank if he could really beat Icepig. Lucas said he was confident in his abilities, and in response, Johnson pulled $1,000 out of his wallet to bet for Lucas. Further events, known however only from the words of Lucas himself, developed as in a magical fairy tale. Frank easily beat Icepig, not allowing him to touch the ball for the entire game. Bumpy then invited Lucas to follow him to his car. Ellsworth asked the young man his name as well as the whereabouts of his parents. Having learned that Frank was from North Carolina and that he had nobody close in New York, he inquired what he did for a living. In response, Lucas confessed to all of his shenanigans over the past six months. After hearing a story from Frank about some recently robbed gamblers wanting him dead, Bumpy told his driver to go to the big track. Once there, Johnson informed everyone gathered that Frank Lucas was working for him from then on and should be left alone. That evening, Lucas and Bumpy traveled to practically every place Frank had robbed over the past few months. It was the same scene everywhere. Bumpy Johnson would go on and on about Lucas working for him and the victims of the robberies would nod politely and obediently agree. Having solved all Lucas's problems, Bumpy took him to an expensive store where he dressed him from head to toe, and then took him to his home, where Frank had a room waiting for him. Johnson told Lucas to go to bed because they had a lot of important things to do the next day. This is the story of how Bumpy Johnson came into the life of Frank Lucas. According to him, from that moment until the day of Johnson's death, he was his right-hand man. However, was this really the case? Most historians of organized crime do not deny the fact that Frank Lucas knew who Bumpy Johnson was and may have been acquainted with him, but how intimately they knew each other is unknown. What is generally known is that Ellsworth Johnson's widow denied the fact that Frank Lucas was a confidant of her husband. According to her, he performed the duties of a mere footman and bodyguard from time to time, and borrowed much of his story from the tales of Flash Walker. This man actually worked for Bumpy Johnson for a while and lived with his family, but they had a conflict and Bumpy chased him away, which you can learn more about in our video about Bumpy. Frank Lucas himself got mixed up about even the simplest details, which does not add plausibility to his version. For example, recalling in his book about his first meeting with Bumpy, the one that took place in a pool hall, Lucas describes his height as 5 feet 10 inches, while other people who knew Bumpy say that in reality his height was barely more than 5 foot 7. In addition to his duties as Bumpy's bodyguard and driver, Lucas also ran an illegal gambling outlet. It was a bread and butter location, the office was near a busy subway station, and brought in a good income. Sometimes Lucas also dealt heroin, though not as much as he did a couple of years ago, which he was arrested for. He was sentenced to a 30-month sentence to be served in the Lewisburg prison. By the time Frank Lucas was released, the big news was the Vietnam War. The war was not favored by the general population, so very often the news discussed the most unsavory stories about the military. One night Lucas heard the newscaster say that many soldiers in Vietnam suffered from heroin addiction. According to the announcer, it was a drug from the so-called Golden Triangle, which included Burma, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam itself. The heroin there was so strong that it was addictive after the first use, and it was much cheaper and more potent than any drug that could be found in the United States. This story was one that Lucas remembered for a long time. He thought about the profits that could be made if he bought heroin in Southeast Asia and then brought it back to sell in Harlem. Frank decided to consult with Bumpy on this matter, but the idea did not arouse his enthusiasm. As Lucas later recalled, Johnson told him that then was not the time. According to Lucas, after the death of Bumpy Johnson in the late 1960s, Frank took control of all illegal gambling, from which he immediately pulled out $3 million in cash and took the risk of going to Southeast Asia for heroin. The Vietnam option was off right away because of the war. Frank knew little about Burma or Laos, and as for Thailand, he knew that American soldiers were sent on vacation from Vietnam to its capital, Bangkok. Lucas decided that he would first get to Bangkok and there, on the spot, tried to find American soldiers who would put him in touch with small dealers and those, in turn, with large suppliers. 
Lucas was also going to Asia because he did not want to have to deal with the Italian mafia families. By the late 60s, the situation was that a potential heroin dealer in New York City either had to deal with Cosa Nostra or not deal in heroin at all. Lucas did not trust the Italians and tried to avoid doing business with them. Later, he would go to great lengths to establish a reputation as the first to break with the Mafia and establish direct shipments from Asia. However, the journey of Frank Lucas in Southeast Asia is a topic for a separate and detailed conversation. In his numerous stories and interviews, he positioned himself as an innovator, the man who first thought of bringing heroin to the States from Southeast Asia. According to him, he first traveled there in 1969. After spending 28 hours in the seat of a passenger plane, Lucas arrived in Bangkok, where he asked the first cab driver he met to take him to a bar where people like him, that is, black people, could be found. The driver took Frank to a bar called Riches, where he spent the entire night behind the bar, observing the customers and trying to determine which ones might be involved in the drug trade. On one of the following nights, he got into a conversation with the man he said could get 10 kilos of pure heroin. Frank declined the offer, as he needed much more. The interlocutor suggested that Lucas wait a while until he meet with the right people and decided how many kilograms they could sell altogether, but Frank refused. He didn't want too many people to know about the purpose of his trip. Eventually, his daily visits to the bar led to the right man coming up to Lucas. Frank described him as a man who was the spitting image of Agent 007. In their first meeting, they agreed to deliver 150 kilograms of heroin at a price of 4,200 per kilo. The volume was later increased to 225 kilograms. At the next meeting, 007 said he would like to introduce Frank to some people. They traveled to a U.S. military base where the Bond lookalike set Frank up with some high-ranking people. Lucas didn't mention the man's name, but said that he had eagles on his epaulets. This military man could see to it that Lucas's cargo was shipped by military planes. For this favor, Frank had to pay $125,000. He agreed. Agent 007, having received the money for the goods, told Lucas that the heroin would be delivered to the McGuire Joint Military Base in the United States the day after his return home. The drug dealer only needed to drive up to the base's gate number 27. Back in the United States, Lucas immediately met up with the four guys who worked for him in Harlem. In two cars, including one truck, they traveled to the military base located in the state of New Jersey. When the car stopped near the gate, two guys came out of the base and loaded the merchandise into Lucas's truck. Back in Harlem, Frank and his men unloaded the bags at the warehouse he had rented in advance. Later, the heroin was moved to a special apartment where it was prepackaged for retail sale. In those years, every New York drug dealer tried to give his product a memorable and colorful name, unique enough to attract customers. The unsightly bags with equally diluted drugs inside bore names that rock bands would envy. Frank Lucas christened the product Blue Magic. Ever since he'd started selling the Golden Triangle stuff, Lucas had a favorite pastime, sitting in one of his cars, as dirty and inconspicuous as possible, not far from his dealer's spots, and watching them sell. According to him, the pushers who didn't sell Blue Magic begged the addicts to buy their product. Almost on their knees, Lucas's product sold out much quicker. Pretty soon, Lucas's business needed to expand and he needed people he could rely on. Despite the years Frank had spent in New York, he still felt like an outsider. He trusted only his relatives, so once he settled in New York, he moved all of his younger brothers and older blood relatives there from North Carolina. Soon this group became known as the Country Boys. That's when Frank got his nickname, Superfly. Something like a player or stylish gangster. It's also the title of a 1972 movie about a black drug dealer who wants to retire, but before doing so, he makes the deal of a lifetime, one that will secure him for the rest of his life. Three months later, Superfly had to head back to Bangkok. Lucas was about to negotiate a new, larger shipment. This time, he was interested in buying 500 kilos of the drug, for he was now starting a deal in bulk as well. At the height of his organization, Frank, in addition to retail sales in Harlem, supplied the wholesale to dealers in Los Angeles, Milwaukee, Chicago, and Denver. Money flowed to Superfly by the boatload. He purchased multiple apartments and had several expensive cars parked in the garage of each of his homes. He traveled often. He especially enjoyed flying to Paris or the Côte d'Azur, that is, the French Riviera, on weekends. It was a life surrounded by the most beautiful women, the best food, and all kinds of luxury. 
But to launder the sums that gave him such a life, Frank Lucas needed a legal business. One of Superfly's first such businesses was a gas station. It functioned until 1973 when the oil crisis broke out. Then the gas station had to say goodbye, as it became unprofitable. Then Lucas had his own supermarket, dry cleaner, and a bar called Turntable. The bar, by the way, was in partnership with singer Lloyd Price. Price, on the other hand, offered Frank to finance the making of a movie called The Ripoff. Superfly agreed to invest, but out of curiosity, he decided to meet with the producers. At this meeting, they asked Frank if he would like to play the role of a character named Johnny Cool, who, according to the screenwriters, was supposed to be the boss of a criminal gang from Harlem. Lucas replied in agreement. According to him, it was an interesting but exhausting experience. Superfly had to get up every day at 4 a.m. to be on set by 5, but he flatly refused to play in the sex scene, and when the director began to insist, it almost ended in a fight. This was the end of Lucas's career as an actor. Well, of course, Lucas also laundered money directly through the bank, as many drug traffickers did at the time. In the late 1960s, drug dealers used couriers called Smurfs. The Smurf would take the dealer's dirty money, place it in the bank, and then transfer it to the drug dealer's account. But in 1970, the Bank Secrecy Act was passed, which required banks and other financial institutions to report to the U.S. Treasury Department on large transactions from $10,000 and up. As it happened, Frank Lucas was indirectly connected with the first lawsuit initiated with the Treasury Department against Chemical Bank, at that time the sixth largest bank in the United States. Lucas managed to bribe two employees who worked in different branches of this bank. Superfly didn't even use Smurfs, preferring to bring his money to the bank in person. He would come to one of the two branches of the bank with bags filled with small bills, usually up to 100 grand. The teller would then exchange these bills for new ones, 50 and $100 bills each. On paper, however, that money came into Lucas's account from other accounts and was then withdrawn. And on one such visit, Lucas came to the attention of police officers who by then were keeping tabs on the bank tellers. To exchange 250,000 bucks, Lucas met with a clerk near the bank. Police officers saw him place bags full of bills in the teller's car and then pick up more bags hours later. Chemical Bank was charged with violating the Bank Secrecy Act, and its vice president, Pascal Dumaro, was charged with money laundering. The compromised officials eventually agreed to plead guilty to charges of falsifying tax returns. It turned out that the teller's services cost Lucas $12,000. That was not much for him, since the years 1972 to 73 were the heyday of Superfly's empire. Organized crime researcher Ron Chepesiuk reports that during that period of time, according to the most conservative estimates, Lucas managed to sell $240 million worth of goods at retail. Such a figure, in our opinion, is an overestimate. But even if we assume half or one-third, it was still a colossal amount of money for the early 1970s. Lucas's third trip to Asia was even more ambitious. This time, Frank would not only negotiate to purchase one and a half tons of heroin, but also to find out exactly where the product came from. Agent 007 agreed to show him the place. A few weeks later, Frank Lucas, a native of small town LaGrange, North Carolina, was walking through the jungle somewhere near the border of Burma and Laos. According to Superfly, Agent 007 had himself prudently declined the trip but gave him his own chaperones. The drive to the poppy fields took several days, but what he saw was worth the effort. Land the size of all five New York City boroughs was covered in poppies. The guides, accompanying Lucas, told him the story of how the land became the birthplace of heroin. In the 1960s, a group of anti-communist Chinese from the ranks of the Kuomintang army settled in an area that was near the border between China and Burma. These men were supported by the CIA, who was interested in them as a counter to communist China. The Kuomintang controlled much of the Golden Triangle and produced heroin, and the CIA turned a blind eye to this, thus allowing them to finance the fight against China. Frank was delighted with the tour, feeling as if he had just visited Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. On that eventual day, he bought 100 kilograms of heroin, but promised to return again. Although a few hours after the whole crew headed back, they were attacked, according to Lucas. A group of masked men with assault rifles in their hands came out from behind the trees. They waved their weapons and shouted in shrill voices. Frank pulled out a gun and started firing. A shootout ensued and went on for several minutes. 
Several of the guides accompanying Superfly were killed. Lucas lost half of his merchandise, but the worst part was that his squad lost almost half of their food supplies. In the evening, one of Lucas's escorts brought in some worms. Frank looked at them disgusted for a long time while the others ate them with appetite, but hunger took its toll and he ate the worms too. After such a modest dinner, Superfly fell into dreamland, and when he woke up, he felt a high fever. The Ties had to put the Harlem Thunderbolt on a makeshift stretcher and carry him in their arms until he was well enough to walk without help. A few days later, everyone was back in Bangkok. This is the version from Frank Lucas himself. However, many witnesses, especially law enforcement officers who knew him well, believed that it was beyond his power to organize such an operation. According to Judge Johnson, Frank was a country boy, boastful and superficial, though not without a touch of charisma. Also, Superfly was rumored to have trouble reading and counting. DEA agents who worked in the agency's Bangkok office in the early 1970s were skeptical of Superfly's stories, to say the least. Agent Peter Davis and his staff didn't know who Frank Lucas was and had no information that he was operating in Southeast Asia. Of course, there was the possibility that the enterprising drug dealer could have somehow slipped under the agent's radar. But if he really was as big a trafficker as he described himself, it would have been very difficult for him to do so. However, DEA agents were aware of another trafficker who could be considered the pioneer of the heroin route from Southeast Asia to America. That person was Leslie Ike Atkinson, also known as Sergeant Smack. Atkinson was known to have served in the military and did indeed dabble in illegal activities. Back in the mid-1950s, he opened several gambling establishments in West Germany and Spain, and then entered the black market, profiting from trade in gasoline, stolen cigarettes, and dried rations. Atkinson himself later said he had nothing to do with drugs in those years. He was quite comfortable with the black market and had no intention of changing a thing. But in the mid-1960s, the Vietnam War was gaining momentum, and Atkinson saw an opportunity to get into the heroin trade. As a former sergeant and someone who knew a lot of people in the military, Ike knew exactly how the army functioned. He knew about the chaos that reigned in the army ranks, and he also knew about the fact that in one week, hundreds of airplanes flew between Southeast Asia and the United States, and only dozens of them were checked at best. So Atkinson set up his heroin smuggling network quite easily. Atkinson claimed he met Lucas in 1972 through his nephew, and he said Superfly didn't make his first trip to Bangkok until 74. Frank wanted to fly to Thailand with his wife Juliana and brother Shorty, but didn't know how to get a visa. Ike personally took the whole company to the Royal Thai Embassy in DC. As for Lucas, he said in interviews that he first traveled to Asia back in 1969 or 1970, but had never heard of Ike. Ike also talked about who the man Superfly dubbed Agent 007 really was. According to him, that person was a Thai man of Chinese descent named Luechi Rubiwat. He was a business partner of Atkinson's, and together they owned Jack's American Star Bar in the town of Phetchaburi, located 100 kilometers or 74 miles from Bangkok. It was a very popular vacation spot for Americans. The bar catered to black soldiers, and Luechi even learned to speak English with a Harlem accent. It was he who would be the middleman for heroin shipments. Lucas, however, took a different viewpoint. He claimed that when he began to do business with Agent 007, he was again unaware of Atkinson's existence. When the New Yorker magazine published an interview with Superfly where he told his astounding story, Ike was serving his 30-year sentence. After reading the article, Ike was so outraged that even he wrote a long letter to the magazine's editorial board in which he debunked, one by one, all the myths that Lucas had generously fed to the article's author, Mark Jacobson. For starters, Atkinson stated that Lucas was not related to him. Superfly's claim that Sergeant Smack was his cousin was just a figment of his imagination. Ike also detailed the exact circumstances under which Lucas became his business partner. After Herman Jackson, his longtime business partner, went to prison, Atkinson needed someone who could handle business matters and oversee the receipt of shipments in the States. Frank asked Atkinson himself if he would partner with him. Atkinson replied that they could only cooperate if Frank handled business in New York. Atkinson also revealed what Lucas was actually doing in Bangkok. His story doesn't include shootouts with mysterious gunmen or trips to giant poppy fields. According to him, Lucas fell asleep upon arriving in Thailand, and when he woke up, his first inclination was to have lunch. 
After lunch, Frank went to a bar where he was joined by several of Atkinson's acquaintances, soldiers who had fought in Vietnam. According to Sergeant Smack, it was there in the bar that Lucas heard those stories about fighting, which later embellished the fiction he gave to the journalists. Lucas did not even spend five days in Bangkok as he had originally planned, but only three and slept most of the time in his hotel room. On the third day of his stay in Thailand, Lucas went to Ike's house and stated that he wanted to buy heroin. Frank also told him that he had heard there were two kinds of heroin there in Thailand, and he wanted to be sold the best one. At Atkinson's request, Luigi brought two samples of the product. Frank then poured the contents of one bag into his palm, licked it off, and drank water. Lucas did the same with the heroin from the second shipment. After washing his hands, Frank stated that he liked the second sample better and would buy it. Atkinson recalled with a smile that both the first and second samples were from the same batch. Atkinson also criticized other Superfly tales. One of them related that once, because of a cyclone hitting Bangkok, he used the only available airplane to transport heroin, the one carrying U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Atkinson called the story absolutely absurd. In his opinion, Lucas merely used his book and subsequent interviews to recall certain myths that had been circling among American soldiers in Vietnam. Atkinson also found Lucas's claim that he used double-bottom coffins to transport heroin to the U.S. controversial, to put it mildly. In a 2000 interview, Superfly claimed that he sent a carpenter he knew from North Carolina to Bangkok to make 28 coffins, exact replicas of those used by the U.S. Army, with false bottoms large enough to hold a load of 6 to 8 kilos. According to Atkinson, he had never met any carpenter from North Carolina. He was assisted by a carpenter named Leon, who he had known all his life. However, Leon never had anything to do with making coffins for heroin transport and made his living making teak furniture. The notorious legend of moving heroin in coffins grew from there, as heroin was transported inside such furniture. And the rumor about coffins, according to Sergeant Smack, was started by Lucas himself. Atkinson recalled that one time he and Leon were manufacturing said furniture in the workshop when Superfly came in. He asked what they were doing, and Ike jokingly replied that they were making coffins. DEA agents later also said that they had no evidence to support the use of coffins for transporting heroin. What conclusion can we draw from all of the above about how Lucas's organization operated? As always, we will not make a definitive statement, but we will summarize the three versions that exist and that we have discussed here. It is absolutely certain that Frank started his career as a drug dealer, buying goods from Italians and selling them for retail and small wholesale. Then he either went to the Golden Triangle and organized deliveries directly from there, connecting retail and small wholesale with large wholesale. Or, as Atkinson insists, he still continued to work with the Italians for a while in the 1970s, but then Frank had some problems with them and he started working with Atkinson. In other words, the whole story about Asia is fictional, according to this version, stolen from Atkinson, just as the story of working for Bumpy was stolen from Walker. But whether Lucas is a fibber or not is up to you to decide. On October 26, 1970, a boxing match between Muhammad Ali and Jerry Quarry took place in Atlanta. In the eyes of ordinary Americans, any appearance of Ali in the ring, even against a weak opponent, was a national event. This fight was different from the rest, though. It was the first for the great boxer after a three-year hiatus. When Frank Lucas traveled to Atlanta for the fight, he met some familiar dealers from California. Even though it was October and the weather was warm, the Californians were wearing mink coats and even hats. In these outfits, they were like masters of the whole world, and they paid attention to Lucas's clothes, which were expensive, but not that luxurious. One dealer from Los Angeles, after looking at Frank up and down, said, And we thought you were a success in New York. Lucas justified himself by saying that he had come from a boxing match, not a fashion show, but his words made no impression. The Californians were convinced that Lucas was poorer than they were and therefore could not afford what they could. Frank's self-esteem was hurt, and he decided to get even with his offenders. He decided that the next time there was a big fight in New York, he would outshine all the critics with the richness of his outfit. A few months later, it was announced that Muhammad Ali would have his next fight in New York against Joe Frazier. The day after the announcement of the fight, Lucas rushed to meet with two furriers who owned a store in downtown New York, and he ordered a chinchilla fur coat and hat. The fur coat cost Lucas about 100000 bucks, and the hat about 25000 
When he arrived at the fight, he said he made such an impression on those in attendance that some of his recent offenders immediately walked from the event. Frank felt like a winner. He sat in one of the most expensive seats in the hall, a few yards away from the ring, while Frank Sinatra struggled to get into the press box, and many celebrities who did not have a ticket were escorted out to the hall by security. Sitting not far from Lucas was another famous drug dealer, Frank Matthews. There was no great friendship between them, but they treated each other with respect. After greeting each other warmly, the guys decided among themselves to place bets on the winner of the fight. Lucas wrote that the moment he shouted his offer of $500,000 to Matthews, three guys sitting nearby looked at him strangely. The three men sitting between Lucas and Matthews were federal agents from the Drug Enforcement Administration. It was then, according to Lucas's version, that he first came to the attention of law enforcement, not as a small-time dealer, but as a drug lord. However, this version is not true. New York cops and DEA officers were well aware of who Frank Lucas was much earlier, at least since the late 1960s. For a long time, however, they were unable to do anything about it for lack of sufficient evidence. The ice was broken in December 1971 when New York City Police Commissioner William McCarthy ordered the Narcotics Division to compile a list that would include 100 of the city's top drug traffickers. The list was soon created and from that point, authorities focused their efforts on going after the major suppliers rather than small street-level drug dealers. From then on, it took about three years for authorities to bring Lucas to trial. Frank Lucas went on trial by 1974. He was joined in the dock by 11 other men, among which Ralph Tutino stood out. Tutino had been dealing heroin wholesale in New York for many years. At first, like most of the Italians, he received the goods from Europe and when the network collapsed, he switched to Mexico and Asia. Lucas immediately admitted to DEA agents that Italians were supplying him with heroin. Eventually, the prosecutor named Tutino as the primary supplier and Lucas as the one responsible for distribution. Frank was facing a life sentence. However, the prosecution ran into trouble. Important witnesses started dying. The prosecution's case was fading. And that wasn't their only problem. Shortly after the trial, rumors began to circulate that one of the jurors had been bribed. The grand jury suspected him of taking a $50,000 bribe and then using some of that money to bribe fellow jurors. The trial lasted about six weeks. In public, prosecutors radiated confidence in their victory. But on December 24, 1974, the jury found the defendants not guilty. Some of the jurors later attributed their decision to the fact that key witnesses on the prosecution side simply did not inspire their confidence. They were people with dubious reputations and criminal records as well. However, Lucas did not rejoice for long. In late January of the following year, DEA agents searched his home in Teaneck, New Jersey. They found more than $500,000 as well as papers related to one of his bank accounts in the Cayman Islands. Superfly was arrested again. He later talked about how the money the agents found was only a fraction of the larger amount the cops stole. In his book, Lucas also claimed that agents broke into his home without a proper warrant and also permitted themselves to hurt his wife, Julia. According to recollections of the DEA agents who conducted the search, the situation was a little different. Mrs. Lucas began throwing money from the second floor as soon as she saw the agents approaching the house. Later, the situation even gave rise to a kind of meme. The agents joked among themselves that they should bring a baseball glove to such events, since it would come in handy as the criminals got rid of their evidence, throwing it out of the windows. This time, the investigation managed to prove a connection between Frank Lucas and members of the Gambino Mafia family. According to the indictment, in November 1973, Tony Delotro delivered a package to Anthony Verzino containing about 5 kilograms of heroin, for which he received 250 grand. A few weeks later, the heroin was delivered to Lucas at a Bronx hotel. On January 27, 1976, before the sentencing, Judge Irving Ben Cooper stated that in his 35 years of trial practice, he had never met a larger and more dangerous threat to society than the defendant. Superfly was sentenced to 77 years behind bars. Perjury charges were also filed against one of Lucas's attorneys, John D. McConnell. He doubled as Lucas's courier, delivering his money to the Cayman Islands. It was proved that in 1973 to 74, about $500,000 were transferred to an anonymous account. However, this was the only money of Frank's that the authorities were able to locate. In September 1977, 
Frank Lucas admitted to authorities that he had been running his heroin empire from prison and agreed to cooperate in exchange for a reduced sentence. Superfly attributed his act to concern for his brothers, Lawrence and Ezel. According to a former DEA agent, Frank was an informant one could have only dreamed of having before. Lucas's willingness to cooperate with the feds was explained simply. If you're 48 years old, facing a 70-year sentence, and have a couple million dollars hidden somewhere, you're probably going to try to save yourself. Lucas tried to please the feds as best he could. Thanks to his testimony, a major heroin dealer from Harlem named Leroy Butler was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Superfly claimed he had been passing him drugs in exchange for extenders. Some detectives felt that while Lucas's information was valuable, on the whole, he did not tell the feds anything new and merely confirmed what the investigation already had. However, Themis thought otherwise, and in 1981, Frank was released from prison. Frank was only 51 years old, and he could start life again with a clean slate. However, in 1984, Lucas quietly decided to revive his drug empire. In the Ridley Scott movie, Frank Lucas's wife is shown as an outside character, a woman that the Harlem thug tried his best to protect from his trade. In reality, Lucas's life partner was different. By the time Superfly was released, he was no longer married to Juliana, but they were still socializing. In the early 1980s, Juliana was arrested for selling 3.5 kilos of cocaine to an undercover DEA agent. She served her sentence in Los Angeles. There, in 1983, the former Mrs. Lucas met Angelina Esperon. The women had much in common. They both came from Latin America and talked to each other in Spanish, much better than in English. Angelina, like Julia, had been in prison on drug charges and had become an informant. Esperon had spent almost three weeks in the same cell as Juliana. During that time, the women seemed to have become thoroughly good friends. Superfly's ex-spouse decided that she had found a true soulmate and confided to her new friend that she wanted to get back into the drug trade. According to her, there should be no problems with the goods. She had reliable suppliers of both heroin and coke, and one of the suppliers was her ex, Frank Lucas, who was then living in New Jersey. When Esperon reported the information to DEA agents, they were taken with surprise, as one of the employees later admitted they could not have guessed that Lucas was so stupid. Angelina continued to socialize with Juliana. Julia liked her new friend so much that she mentioned she would like to keep in touch with her after her release on bail. Esperon gave Julia her phone number and said she looked forward to calling her when she was out. As for Esperon, once free, she told everything to the police, who gave her special agent Victor Olivieri to help. Olivieri, a veteran of the Drug Enforcement Administration, spoke fluent Spanish and was willing to provide all the help she needed. In January 1984, Esperon waited for a call from Julia. Angelina invited the girl to visit Miami for a few days. The friends went to one of the nightclubs where Esperon introduced Juliana to a Pakistani who, according to her, could help buy heroin. Soon, Olivieri came into play. Esperon introduced Julia to the DEA agent, presenting him as her brother. Over the next several weeks, Victor spoke to Julia on the telephone at least three times about buying a large shipment of smack. Eventually, Juliana promised to introduce Esperon and Olivieri to the heroin supplier, her ex-husband, Frank Lucas. The first meeting, which took place at the Sheraton LaGuardia Hotel in Queens, ended in nothing. Esperon and Lucas said a lot of pleasantries and compliments to each other, but they failed to agree on purchasing any drugs. Angelina went to the next meeting with a tape recorder inside her purse. This time, they finally managed to come to an agreement. After the meeting, which was in New York, Esperon and Victor returned to Miami, and Julia went to Las Vegas to attend a court hearing for drug charges. In mid-March, Julia called Esperon and advised her not to travel to New York until she had resolved her legal problems in Las Vegas. Victor then called Lucas to arrange another meeting. Superfly was eager to meet, but that meeting was no longer destined to happen. Shortly after the phone call, Juliana was taken into custody. During the hearing, she learned that her adored friend was a police informant and her alleged brother was a DEA agent. On March 19, 1984, Lucas was arrested at his home in Inglewood, New Jersey. Frank was charged with conspiracy to distribute heroin. Superfly's attorneys tried to convince the jury that their client was not only still in the witness protection program, but was working for the government to help fight criminals. Admittedly, the defense had a problem. They couldn't find a single person in law enforcement who would admit to giving Frank such an assignment. The defense also tried to get Lucas out on bail, but nothing came out of that either. 
Not even the help of boxing legend Joe Lewis's widow, who was willing to write a $1 million check, made a difference. Judge Bramwell responded by saying, If she wants to do it, that's her business, but I'm still not letting him out. Lucas, on a combination of charges including distribution of heroin plus a parole violation, was facing a life sentence. However, in September 1985, Frank was sentenced to only seven years in prison. Former law enforcement officials speculated that Lucas received such a lenient sentence in exchange for information that could once again interest the state. After his next release, Lucas settled somewhere on the East Coast. The world managed to practically forget about him. But in 2000, the personality of Superfly caught the interest of Mark Jacobson, one of the most popular journalists of The New Yorker at the time. Frank gave Jacobson a tour of Harlem and showed him the places of his glory days. Jacobson's article caught the eye of screenwriter Steven Zylian. Zylian, the Academy Award-winning screenwriter for Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List, read the article and was intrigued by what he saw as the flip side of the American dream. In Jacobson's article, Zylian saw the story of a black gangster who single-handedly managed to escape the abject poverty of the rural American South and rise to become a major drug lord who challenged the white mobs. As to whether the facts presented in The New Yorker corresponded to reality, the venerable screenwriter did not seem to care. Two years after the article was published, Zylian wrote a script, which was then purchased by Universal. The company's management highly regarded Zylian, so they started making big plans for a screen adaptation. Initially, the director of Superfly Saga was supposed to be Antoine Fuqua, who just recently had made the movie Training Day, and Frank Lucas was to be played by Denzel Washington. The role of the main antagonist, assistant prosecutor of the state of New Jersey, Richie Roberts, would be played by Benicio Del Toro. But despite the fact that Universal managed to gather an excellent team of professionals, there were many difficulties. Rumors surfaced that the costs of making the film were higher than expected. In May 2004, Universal was taken over by General Electric, and the new owners began to cut costs. Zylian substantially revised his script, and Ridley Scott took over as director. Alongside Denzel Washington would be Russell Crowe, replacing Del Toro. Soon, shooting of the movie began. Rumor has it that former DEA agents were already dissatisfied with the liberties that Zylian took in the script. One of the retired agents saw Lou Rice, recalled being on the set of the movie and talking to one of the assistant directors. When Rice introduced himself and talked about his background, the executive replied that he was probably not going to like the film because it showed the events from Frank Lucas's point of view, as Hollywood likes to glorify and romanticize anything to do with gangsters. The movie was released in October 2007 and brought the company a big profit. With a budget of $100 million, it collected more than $250 million. Law enforcement officials were not thrilled with the movie. Former DEA agents even filed a lawsuit against Universal, pointing out that the events shown in the movie defamed not only them, but dozens of other agents. The suit was eventually dismissed because there was not a single person in the movie who, according to the judge, who could be 100% identified as a DEA agent. Frank Lucas, on the other hand, got a bit of publicity, after which he went back to being ordinary. Shortly before the movie was released, he was involved in a car accident in which he broke his leg and was confined to a wheelchair. In 2012, the man who once threw hundreds of thousands of dollars left and right tried to use a previously cashed federal disability check for $17,000. Given his advanced age and health, the judge sentenced him to five years of probation. On May 30th, 2019, Frank Superfly Lucas passed away at the age of 88.